Glad to be with you guys. Hello. Good morning or whatever time you might be tuning in. Glad to be with you. Uh, we're coming together here, going through the Bible in a year. This Thursday, October 12th. So here are the passages that we have for readings for today. Um, we have 2 Timothy chapter 2, which is where we will be this morning. Uh, or today, but again, whatever time you're watching. And then Deuteronomy chapter 5 and Deuteronomy chapter 6. So 2 Timothy chapter 2 is where we're going to be today. And then your other readings for today are Deuteronomy chapter 5 and 6. So let's go there. Let's unpack God's word together um, in this short book of 2 Timothy. Uh, Paul's uh, letter to his spiritual son in Timothy, who um, is actually has quite the responsibility. So we'll get into that in a minute. So let's open up in prayer. Father, I thank you for today. Put this day in your hands, Lord. We ask, God, that this day would glorify you. Pray, Lord, that you help us to better understand your word, Lord. We pray, Father, for Israel, Lord, and for the peace of Israel. And we pray, Father, that you would be with your people there. We pray that it would be more clear that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And may leaders... Uh, make wise decisions, Lord. And I, I pray, Father, for Arabs and Israelis alike that they'd come to the truth of Jesus Christ and who you are, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Second Timothy chapter 2. Paul is like the spiritual father of, not like, but is the spiritual father of Timothy. Timothy, a young man who has been with <clears throat> Paul for a little bit of time now, he's going to a, a lot of places that Paul's already been, and he is planting churches. He's setting up ministries. He's trying to fight, fight. He's trying to find um, and identify um, the calling on men and women's lives for them to take different positions within churches. Um, so that way they have the proper structure and they have the best chance at being successful and so they can be healthy and properly represent what God um, calls them to be. So we pick up in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's read and take a look at some of the things that Paul is trying to encourage Timothy about and some of the um tips and insights and wisdom that he's trying to impart to him so second timothy chapter two it says this you then my son right not his actual son but his like spiritual son be strong in the grace that is in christ jesus so timothy be strong in that grace know about it learn about it be confident about it verse two and the things you have heard me say, so be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. And trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So that reads kind of weird, so I'll read it again. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So we say in Timothy, be on the lookout for reliable men. Who could teach others because it's important to have a variety of people to teach um, it is good uh, to have maybe a primary or a couple of uh, teachers that uh, carry the weight of teaching the congregation weekly I think that's okay but if it's really just one person all of the time uh, that lends itself to think that it's only t tied to that, that the teaching is only tied to that one person. And it's much healthier to identify reliable men who are able to teach and then entrust that teaching to those men. Because this is not about us or one person. This is about the message of Jesus Christ and having it go out through as many qualified and reliable teachers as possible is a good thing. 
And teaching could happen uh, in a large group on a Sunday morning, could happen in a small group during a study, but the teaching should be coming from many places so that it does not somehow um, implicitly deliver message that the teaching um, and the knowledge can only come from one person. That's how um, you could get into trouble very quickly. And plus, Timothy wasn't called to stay in one spot and do all the teaching. He was called to identify people, empower, equip them, identify them, and release them. That's what he was called to do. Empower, equip, identify, and release. Too many ministries that don't do that. People are just looking for job security, and they're looking for their own sort of title and position, uh, and foolishly thinking that maybe they're the only ones that can do it. And the New Testament mo model was to... Uh, identify, empower, equip, release, you know? So anyway, so he's talking to Timothy saying, and trust to the rival men who are also be qualified to teach others. Verse three, Timothy, you endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ, like a good soldier, meaning this is a fight. This is warfare. Uh, it is. And um, engage in this like a soldier would. Um, with discipline, with focus. Verse four, no one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. In other words, he's encouraging Timothy to not get lost in the weeds uh, in other conversations, other circumstances. He's encouraging him to fix his focus where it needs to be, not to major in the minors, but to major in the major things, the major important things of the faith and of the ministry and what he's really called to, to not get ca caught up on paint colors or um, other things, you know, things that we can get caught up are, you know, uh, paint colors, pews or chairs or, and, and listen, we all have opinions on all that and it's fine. But the reality is those are not major, major things. Um, he's saying to Timothy, Make sure you focused on the majors. And verse 5 <clears throat> says, similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete. So he uses the illustration of a soldier. Now he uses an illustration of an athlete, which in Greek and Roman cultures, uh, athletics was highly regarded. They really appreciated their athletics and competitions. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. So in other words, um, athletes have strict training. Again, they have focus. Um, there are rules involved. And so that is like uh, Paul is inferring that there's rules in God's kingdom too. And he has set the rules and he set the agenda. He set the goal. So so play by those rules that God has said to play by and compete by. Verse 6, the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Meaning that it's not wrong for you to get paid while you are doing what you're doing. So somebody offers to pay you, Timothy, um, or you can receive income for what you're doing. There's nothing wrong with that. It's completely fine. Um, welcome that. And so that's why he says the hardworking farmer, which really is another illustration. So we have these three illustrations, a soldier, an athlete, now a farmer, all representing different things. But Paul's using all these to help communicate important things to uh, Timothy. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crop. So it's all right if you're going to get paid while you do this. In fact, it's probably a more ideal situation than it is to tr continue to keep working at the same time that you're ministering. And there certainly is a place for that. I've spent, me personally, uh, most of, um, almost all of, of, of my time, our time, planting this church being bi bivocational, working another job and then um, working as part of the ministry at the church. And just recently um, have I had, by God's grace, uh, the opportunity to go uh, quote-unquote full-time. I think that is definitely a healthier, better way to do it, but not every church in every place is able to do that. And so um, if you can do it, that's great. If the Lord provides the way, that's great. And Paul is saying, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, Paul himself, it says um, in different places when he was ministering, 
um, he would be, uh, he would have another side business. He was building tents and he was doing that. And it's not recorded he did that everywhere, but in some cases he did. He was working as he was ministering. So Timothy might not understand totally what Paul is saying with all these um, um, illish metaphors, uh, the symbolism with the soldier, with the athlete, with the farmer. He might not quite get it. So in verse 7, he encourages Timothy, reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. So he's saying, hey, listen, so bring these things before the Lord, reflect on these things like God. God will give you the ability to understand what I'm saying here. Verse 8, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. It's interesting how so many people forget that part. We try and make church or ministry be about so many other things whether it be gifts, whether it be prophecy, um, whether it be music or an individual, um, all kinds of things. And he's saying, remember Jesus Christ. See, that's the focus here. Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. Hey, that's my gospel. That's the gospel. Verse 9, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. And Paul was being chained like a criminal. Uh, he was in jail multiple times for crimes he did not commit. But I love this. But God's word is not chained. No, it is not. It cannot be stopped. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The elect. The elect are the ones that will come to know Christ. They're the ones that are going to be or have already been born again. So he says, I endure everything for the sake of those people, the elect, the ones that have given their lives to the Lord, that have been born again, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying. Not sure who said it, but he writes it down. Maybe this is his own saying. Maybe Paul heard it from somewhere else, but he's given this to Timothy. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we also reign with him. If we disown him, he will disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. And so a trustworthy saying that Paul has here, really focusing on the Lord and his ability to keep us, to hold us. Verse 14. Keep reminding them, probably the people he's ministering to, Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words, against just arguing about things. This would again be majoring in the minors, arguing about specific words and what they might mean, and even places and dates. Uh, even like in our age, certain things about history, certain things about science. And, and of course, people want to say, well, the Bible best um, proves their position. That's why they're spending so much time in it. And he's just saying, hey, listen, um, be careful about that. Don't just get into arguments about these things. Um, hopefully it can something that can be fruitful. So he says, warn them before God against quarreling about words. It's of no value. It only ruins those who listen. And many times it does, right? They just see everybody fighting and they just see, ah, like... What are they arguing about? People don't even know what they're arguing about half the time, especially the listeners. Verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. As one approved, a workman. So Timothy, make sure you're working. Make sure you're working. You know, we had mentioned about... <clears throat> um, uh, receiving compensation, getting paid to do the work of the ministry. Um, one thing, one benefit for sure, when someone has another job um, in addition to serving in the ministry, one benefit there is that uh, people are aware that you're not there for a paycheck, that you're not what's called a hireling, um, as Jesus would refer to that, someone that's just, they're just there just to get paid. That is a big benefit uh, towards carrying uh, another job and then working for a ministry is that people know, hey, you're here uh, for us. 
you're here for the right reasons you're here because you care about us you're here because you're called um and so he's encouraging timothy here he says listen man be a worker this thing is work you gotta work um to uh, minister to people, to love people, to prepare messages, to understand the Lord's truth. This is work. There's a lot of things you don't want to do. There's situations you don't really want to be around. You'd rather be someplace else doing something else. It's like, nah, push through and do it. This is work. And you want to be a workman that is approved, where you're doing your due diligence. You're not procrastinating. You're not being lazy. You're not finding excuses and ways to blame other people for why you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You want to be an approved workman. And what a good word that is because, I mean, it, it, in my experience and personal opinion, I know a lot of church leaders that have titles, but in my opinion, I wouldn't really consider them workmen, approved workmen. Um, only God really knows. So from my vantage point, I don't know everything going on, but it's like, man, they, they find every reason in the book uh, to not be busy to disengage, to not take responsibility and ownership, to not follow through. And, and these are things that um, Paul is warning Timothy about, saying, listen, if you're going to be leading and appointing and doing these things, you got to be a workman that's approved. Come ready to work. Come ready to work. <clears throat> a workman who, like it says here, does not, to be, need, does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth, right? It's work to do these things. You don't need to be ashamed um, that you're working hard and this is uh, tough stuff and the platform isn't always a, a great place to be. It's a, many times it's a humbling place. And a workman who handles the word of truth that does um, his due diligence, trying to understand the word of God, sits with it and wrestles with it and consults the Lord and it's a hard thing it's not an easy thing but we want to be workmen approved timothy you want to be a workman approved verse 16 another warning here avoid godless chatter stop gossiping stop just talking about a bunch of nonsense you can w waste your time with that he would probably include there in verse 16 um minimize your scrolling uh minimize your time uh spent on screens like it's just avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. It's probably true for any minister or leader of the gospel who wants to do these things. You're going to spend a whole bunch of time on screens and on places that don't have real value. It just leads, it just leads to more and more ungodly stuff. Over time, it will. Every once in a while, probably no, no issue or problem at all. But over time, it's going to lead to more and more ungodliness. Verse 17. <clears throat> their teaching, the people of the godless tadger, uh, chatter and those who indulge in it, their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have wandered away from the truth. I do like how Paul specifically calls out people that are not doing well, um, that have wandered off the path. I like that. I appreciate that, and I think that's a good and healthy thing. <clears throat> sometimes people think if you talk in generalities where sometimes people are trying to call people out but they don't want to use their names i guess there's a time and place for that but there's also a time and place for specifically calling out people's names and saying hey listen like right here hymenius and philetus they're not doing good they're not doing good their teaching is wrong you're going to want to stay away <clears throat> on the other end of the spectrum there are some people that devote way too much time and energy on the internet on blogs on youtube and on places because they think they're getting the best first-hand information about people and they are warning everybody else stay away have nothing to do with so and so get away from this and they just spend disproportionate amounts of time and energy about other people almost usually to the detriment of their own souls and their own walk with the Lord. And that's also problematic. Um, God didn't call us to spend countless time and energy concerned about other people. But if in our close circles, it's people that we know. So Paul obviously knew Hymenaeus and Philetus. He knew them. It's not like, you know, they were across the world somewhere. He heard some rumors and I was making a judgment call on them. Uh, he knew them personally. 
And so when we know someone personally, we've been around to see their fruit and uh, the leaders then specifically call people out by name. I see nothing wrong with that. It's not gossiping or slandering anyone. It's observing and saying what's really going on. But people we don't even know that are so far away from us, so far removed from our circle, and we just hear it second or third hand through various uh, mediums like YouTube or social media or stuff. It's like, man, be careful with that. You, you could just waste your time. Again, usually to the detriment of your own walk with the Lord. So, <clears throat> Hymenius, Philetus, right, stay away from them. Their teachings like gangrene. Verse 18, they wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. So that would be horrific, right? Somebody uh, came and they said, oh, the resurrection um, before the Lord has already happened and people have missed it. We've missed it. Jesus has already resurrected. Yes, that's true, but that's not the resurrection that Hymenius and Philetus were referring to. They're referring to um, this resurrection of the dead at the end before the Lord and they're saying it already happened. And As Paul said, it was destroying the faith of some. Verse 19, nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Um, God knows who those who are his. Verse 20, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. And some are for noble purposes and some for ignoble purposes. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. Um, in other words, Timothy, live a sanctified life live set out set apart so that way you're more like gold and silver and less like wood and clay um make sure um that the lord uh, allows uh, you to be used as an instrument that is holy and that dedicated unto him that's the way you want to be used don't get caught up in other things don't um Allow yourself to be tainted or polluted in other areas. Be careful uh, to make sure that you're, you're being <clears throat> used in, 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 in the best, most holy ways as possible. Verse 22, on the heels of that statement, he says this, which is definitely related. Flee the evil desires of youth, because he's a younger guy. So if you're going to try and have your life and, and yourself be set apart for holy purposes unto the Lord... Um, verse 22 makes a lot of sense. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Because the reality is if you're locked into all kinds of other sin, you can't really serve out of a pure heart because you got your heart also attracted and entertaining other things that are not good and it's not where the Lord wants you to be. And so you can't call on the Lord out of a pure heart that's going to sabotage the leader and it's absolutely going to influence um, and make vulnerable those that the leader uh, is leading. Verse 23, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. He kind of repeats some stuff he had mentioned earlier. It's way too many people are getting caught up in foolish and stupid arguments. Although those people, they don't think it's foolish and stupid to them. They think it's like really important and you know, so you need wisdom and discernment to be able to recognize what's foolish and what's stupid and what's not. So don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth. So verse 25 is helpful. So anybody who teaches and instructs in the word of God, um, people who oppose and there's room for opposing there's room for challenging there's room for questioning there should always be that room anytime there's not it's a huge red flag somebody's unapproachable if you can never um, oppose them or ask a question um, if you can never question what they teach or what comes up it's a huge red flag not a good thing um, we worship a god that's very um, intellectually honest and open to good and honest questions some people just want an argument, cause quarrels. You know, he tells Timothy there, have nothing to do with that. But 
people who might oppose or have questions, who are sincerely seeking something out, uh, maybe who are even challenging because they're like, hey, I think you might have this wrong. There's, there should be, anyways, you room for uh, a good discussion there. <clears throat> so those who oppose him, he must gently instruct, that's a good word, gently, in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So whoever might... Um, there's a different be difference between disagreement and questioning and straight out opposing. And Paul is just making the case, um, hey, listen, whoever is straight out opposing um, and is difficult, they're not really trying to have a conversation to sincerely understand. Um, make sure you gently deal with them. Make sure you pray with them, uh, pray for them, that they would repent and that Hopefully they could come to their senses and better understand who the Lord is and not fall into traps of the devil. Um, so there's a lot of uh, wisdom and practical things that Paul is trying to impart to Timothy here. It works then and it works now. Uh, I tell you what, all this is definitely applicable to 2023 for sure, especially for those um, aspiring to be in leaders or for those that are already leaders that oversee um, other people. So, um, yeah, lots of great wisdom, lots of good insight. And I, I li I'd like to go back to that trustworthy saying, right? Verses 11 to 13. We'll close this out and we'll pray. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful for he cannot disown himself. So let's pray. So Father... Thank you for your word of truth, Lord. Thank you that you do keep us, Lord. Um, thank you, Father, for the amazing opportunity um, to partner in the work that you're doing here on this on this earth, Lord. And um, Father, we do understand that some, Lord, you will call to lead, to teach, to be responsible for others. Um, help us and those people to do it well, Lord. Help us to do it with a pure heart, as you told Timothy, Father. Give us, as believers and as leaders, Lord, the ability to recognize foolish and stupid things, Lord, from foolish and stupid things. Give us the opportunity, um, give us the, uh, the ability to recognize major stuff from minor stuff, Lord. Help us to represent you well, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. It's a blessing reading 2 Timothy chapter 2 with you. Next time we are planning to be together um, on Tuesday. And so look forward to being with you then. Hope the rest of the day of your day is blessed. And ho I hope something from um, today ministers to your heart. God bless you.